Hi, I'm Dr. Evan B. Howard, and I welcome you to this, our video 10B in our series of lectures on the spirituality of Christian worship. This lecture is 10B because I am making it now after producing 20 videos on worship, even though it belongs right after the lecture on proclamation and invitation. So rather than renumber half of the videos, which would probably mean re-recording some phrases as well, I just decided to number this 10B. We are recording this video in the sanctuary of our home church. I like this sanctuary. It's tasteful. It's pleasant. It's not elegant. But it seemed like this was the place to record today's video. Because right here is the location where people come to respond to the call of God on their lives and to receive the body and blood of Christ in communion. And response and communion is what this lecture is all about. First, let's start by reviewing a few points in our previous lectures. First, from, a, from the lecture on the story of worship. You remember I talked there about God's invitations through the big story. I mentioned at key points in history, God acts to deliver and start things again. Renewing his covenant relationship, inviting his people into life, and providing his people with new forms of community, new patterns of living, and new means of living and rehearsing relationship with God inviting his people into life. And I give examples of that. God inviting Abraham and Sarah to fulfill God's mission to be a blessing to the nation. God inviting um, Moses um, and the Israelites into a new life through the law. God inviting uh, human beings through Jesus, inviting them to follow his radical ways of living, and so on and so forth. So you get the idea that the pattern of God is to redeem and then to invite us into the life that God wants to bring. So, that's the first point I want you to, mention, you to notice, is this idea of God inviting as being part of the very big story of God in our lives. Now, second, I want to say something about the lecture that I did um, recently on worship and the structure of interpersonal relationship. If you remember there, we saw this fourfold pattern of approach, meet, share, and integrate, uh, or experience, and then separate the fivefold pattern. Sorry. Approach, meet, share, integrate, or experience, and separate. That characterizes interpersonal relationship. And I suggested that not only does that pattern um, reflect the character of interpersonal relationship, it also reflects the character of Christian worship as well, as an interpersonal interaction, an interpersonal encounter with God. Whether liturgical or charismatic, this is the case. What you, I want you to notice today in this lecture is that we're going to focus our attention on that integration or experience moment. That it's at this point in time where the sharing actually leads to something going on between the parties and, and, the, and the, the relationships moves one step further prior to their separation. That's the moment I want to talk about in this lecture today. Finally, from, from our lecture on proclamation and invitation, I want to remind you that if you remember that was a lecture on sermons, I want to remind you that a sermon is taking us somewhere. If you remember the fourth incarnation of the word, there was four incarnations from God to Christ, from Christ to the text, from the text to the sermon, and then the fourth incarnation is the incarnation from the sermon to life itself. What happens is that the proclamation of a sermon offers an invitation to the hearer. And now at the edge of this fourth incarnation, that edge between the hearing of the sermon 
and the living it out in daily life, there is a point. And that point is our expression of our intention to respond. Okay? So all of this leads us to the idea of response. And when we're thinking of response, especially in the idea of the community of the invitation of Christ, you can't help but think of communion. A worship service takes us somewhere. It brings us before the Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. A congregation meets God together. The service provides space to speak and to listen. We share our hearts a bit with God, and God shares a bit of His heart with us. There's proclamation, and there's invitation. And somewhere through this service, we are invited to respond. Not just to the sermon, but to the person of the risen Christ. The leading of the Holy Spirit. We are asked to respond to the gospel itself. Now, the moment of that response, if we choose to respond positively and not simply to avoid or reject God's invitation, is usually located in most churches, in most church services, just after the sermon, or soon after the sermon. Some traditions acknowledge this moment by a simple prayer of response at the end of the message. Other traditions make a formal altar call at this point, giving place for people to receive salvation or to respond to the invitation that God may be offering in the service. Still other traditions offer a ministry time when people receive prayer and support by an individual or a small group in the context of their response to the service or to a specific word. Still others celebrate the Lord's Supper. Bread is offered. Wine is given to people, both individually and as a community. And they do respond in this way to God's call to come and receive. Now, in this church, we happen to have a combination of things. Here is the altar rail, and people will come to this altar rail and will kneel and receive communion. But also, people are free, after taking communion or before, to go into the back of the church and to receive prayer for a particular need they might have, or to express their response to a call of God on their lives. So that's what we do here at our church. What I want to look at in this lecture from here on out then is the spirituality of that moment. The moment of response. Whether it be an altar call, whether it be communion, whether it be a ministry time, the response moment. First of all, I want to say something about what Christ has done. Now, in a, in a service and in Christianity in general, there's lots of different elements of theology. There's uh, Christ, God's revelation. Um, there is the theology of the attributes of God and so on and so forth. But in a Christian service, our response is fundamentally a response to what Christ has done. And, and, and we've seen this again in the big story. It comes from God and then through Christ particularly. Any action that we make toward God is a response to God's prior action. And the premier prior action in Christianity is the work of Christ. Now, I can't offer, of course, in, in this talk, a full treatment of the theology of, work, of the work of Christ. But in my Brazos introduction to a Christian spirituality, I give you, a in the chapter 5 on, um, on Christian experience, I give you a review of different ways of approaching and different ways of looking at the work of Christ that I just want to summarize briefly right now. First of all, Christ paid the penalty and broke the power of sin. Something else Christ did 
was Christ demonstrated and empowered a new kind of life. Christ battled victoriously over all the enemy powers. Christ reconciled us to God and to others. And finally, God, Christ formed through his work a new cosmic and social order, the church and, and reconciling all things to himself. This is the work of Christ. And our response to God is based on and really is a response to all of that rich, full work of Christ. So what the work of Christ does then, that gives us the place to find out not only what Christ does, but what Christ offers. What does Christ offer? In response to the first and second things that Christ has done, namely breaking the penalty and demonstrating a new kind of life, Christ offers us eternal life. A new kind of life and a new duration of life. Eternal life. It's an eternal kind of life. And, and along with that, there is kind of an attraction and a vision of a new way of living. Um, the, the group called Switchfoot has this famous song that they do called A New Way to Be Human. And I think that that's exactly what Christ does. Gives us a new way to be human. A second thing that Christ offers us is freedom. Freedom from and authority over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Because Christ uh, battled victoriously over the enemy powers. We can share in that victory. We're not doomed to the injustices of racial and national hatred. We are not slaves to our own fleshly impulses. We, are not, we don't have to listen to the voices of the accuser inside of our hearts and minds. The third thing that we have been offered through Christ is acceptance. We are reconciled to God and to others. We, we have acceptance by God. And through this, we have hope for acceptance with others. Reconciliation, unity, harmony, welcome are all provided by Christ. The last thing that I want to mention that Christ offers is a community. No, let me go deeper, a home. Let me go deeper, a family, or even deeper, a body. Intimate body that we participate in. These are the things that Christ offers and that we respond to. We respond to Christ's offer of eternal life. We respond to Christ's offer of freedom and authority. We respond to Christ's offer of unconditional acceptance in spite of our sin. We respond to Christ's offer of a community, a home, a body. So then, what Christ offers is also ultimately what Christ invites, invites us into. In any given Sunday, what does Christ invite us to? Christ invites us to, Jesus Christ invites us through a worship service, any worship service, to an appropriate next step. It might be the step of fundamental commitment to Christ, of saying, I've oriented my life around something else, now I want to orient my life around Christ. And so, there we go. It might simply be taking the risk, an invitation to take the risk and to ask Jesus for healing. Having heard a gospel about Jesus healing, we do the same. It might just be an appropriate letting go of my own for unforgiveness or my prejudice against that person right there or those people. It might just be putting to death my slavery to some kind of addiction, my, my donut addiction. And I, I commit to, to pray, to plan, to put to death this piece of my life. An appropriate next step that God invites me to take. God invites me to join 
in, si- in a simple, general commitment with the body of Christ to say, this is my faith. This is my life. I recite the creed. I pray with the body of Christ. I take the Eucharist. This is my response to the God who is calling me to renew my basic worship commitment to the God of Jesus Christ. That is what we are invited to. In every single service, we are invited to take an appropriate next step of following whatever Christ offers through the work of Christ. So then, how do we respond to this? Three things I want to say, just briefly by the way of how we respond. We hear, we agree, and we act. You're sitting in the, you're sitting in the pews. Something in a song, something in the message, something in your heart clicks. You hear an invitation. That's the first step. Hearing. There's something going on. I think the Spirit is tugging at me. Second step, agree. You could say, I don't want to listen to this. I'm too busy in my life right now. That's going to be dangerous. And you can put it aside. You can avoid it. Or you can agree. Inside of your heart, you can say, yes, I recognize that invitation. And then the third step is to act. Really, the agreement is the big one. If you agree sincerely enough, you will act. But it must move to action. You can come forward and commit. You can go to the ministry time and be prayed for. It ultimately will result in that fourth incarnation. That living it out in life. I mean, and of course, in the middle of all of this, of course, the Holy Spirit is acting. But in this particular lecture, I wanted to talk about our role, our response. The Holy Spirit is working, tugging, grabbing, empowering, all of these kinds of things. But we play a role too. We respond. We live out our services of worship, our Sunday morning worship services, in all kinds of forms. Charismatic, liturgical, evangelical, mainline, whatever it might be. My point here is simply to remind you this. Whatever the form, as you participate in worship, you will have times of response. Be sensitive to this moment of response. As you lead and as you plan worship services, be sensitive to this moment of response. And in this, you are, as you go about doing this, I hope that you have a wonderful day.